This week's episode is sponsored by Change. Change is an online mentoring program that teaches people with no experience how to create a real profitable online business and e-commerce. I have been working with Ryan at Change for a few years now and attended many events and got to meet the amazing community of like-minded people. These guys are the best of the best. The support these guys offer is personal, no bots or employees, there's no experience needed, but like anything in life, it takes time as it's a real business with real results. For more information, go check out Ryan on Instagram at RyanJB and he will guide you through the steps to help build a successful business. You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you are notified for when my next podcast goes live. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Michael Shivers. Michael, how are we? I'm fine, sir. Thank you. First and foremost, thanks for coming on the show. Not a problem. Old school legend on the streets, underworld, flooded the streets, drugs. You've done four sentences. One of your biggest was over 20 years. Yeah. Very well known, very well respected. You look amazing for nearly 80 years old. So fair play, a man who's lived that life, trying to make changes. You've also got a book out soon, which we'll plug straight away. What's your book called? It's called Members Only. And that's because of the, the days when black people went to clubs and the bouncer used to put his hand across and say, sorry, members only. Yeah. A lot of racism then? Oh, very much. I mean, the racism was unbelievable. I mean, as a kid, I used to go to Anfield. I used to hate me. You get 10,000 people standing. If you're standing by a nigger, clap your hands. <laughs> so much hatred. Yeah. Why does that still upset you now? It upsets me because it shaped my whole life as a child. I don't think I'd have ever gone to prison if I had to be for racism. What I wouldn't have done anyway because we went to a dance hall and they said, we don't want niggas coming dancing with our women. So uh, the next week, 20 of us went up, battered them. And during the general melee, two guys got stabbed, two stitch stab wounds. That was it. And I was one of five who got arrested and ended up in Boston. Yeah. Do you think that's what the catalyst was for you to then be filled with anger, rage, trying to not get one up on yourself, but just trying to survive against people who hated someone of colour? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's fucking crazy to think, though, how dark and deep racism was. It's Listen, it's still here. Oh, people, it's still here. People it's think different. it's a way I'd like... In Scotland, if I'm honest, I don't see it. You don't, I don't see it in the streets. I don't see people being racist against each other. I don't... I genuinely don't see it in Scotland, but I know people from England and how bad it still can be down here, especially I've got American friends as well, and they say how bad it is over there. Oh, yeah, my sister... I've got two sisters over there. Well, I had three, one died. But uh, they say when they come over, it's still bad. Sad to think. Yeah. But before we get into everything, Michael, I always like to go back to the start with my guests, get a bit of understanding about you, where you grew up and how it all began. Well, I was one of 11 children. I was number eight. We were born in a two-up, two-down house. My dad was a chief cook at sea. He was there away for like three and four months at a time and uh, brought up by a mother, a housewife, 11 children and uh she did her best as i say it was a cockroach infested house and that was it we just we just grew up we had a good childhood plenty of food plenty of loving plenty of care and that was it how was your dad treated at sea because he was good at his job other captains used to try and poach him and um he had racism I'm obviously, my dad came in 1920. Uh -huh. So 
the racism then was even worse. And he used to fight it every chance he got. And he used to tell us as kids, don't let them get away with it. Fight it, fight it, fight it. Because I watched a film, who was it? I think it was Men of Honor, it was called. Good Cuban... Cuba Gooding Jr. I think he was yeah. he played the part and he was a chef but it was I was, I was that a true story I, I was a true story he lost his leg but the bullying he used to do he used to fight everyone else because he was a cook but he wanted to be a fighter yeah. and then I think they started blowing up the ships they gra grabbed a gun and ended up becoming a hero but I think he lost his was it he lost his leg I think he lost his leg and uh, and he was the first black man to be a uh, and like an underwater oh yeah I, I, I think I know, yeah, yeah I remember and, uh, it. I think it was it Robert De Niro Robert De Niro oh unbelievable film yeah. I think it's a true story for anybody yeah, it was and, good and I the shit it. that he went through lost his leg to try to say you're not good enough mm. still fought against him and beat them fighting his whole life yeah. this was like the 30s and the 40s unbelievable what were you like did you go to school yes went to Granby Street Secondary Modern School from age 5 to 16 and that was it how was that well, in those days, you were just given the basic education, taught to be factory fodder, and told basically told you were going nowhere. And that was it. Were you doing any bad stuff then? A, a little street pilfering and things like that, but nothing major. Mm -hmm. Nothing major. Who was it having such a big family? That was the thing then, back then. It was six kids, eight kids. Yeah. Families had a lot of... Mums and dads had a lot of kids back then. Did you feel the youngest in the family? No, because I, I was in number eight and had three below me. So mm -hmm. that was it. Mm -hmm. Was it a struggle? Poverty? We didn't even feel the poverty because, as I say, my dad had got good wages and my mum managed well. My mum was a good cook. So we used to come home from school for dinner. And uh, that was it. We didn't really feel the poverty. How was it with your dad away all the time? Did that play an effect on your life? It did when he came home because he was so strict. Uh, yeah, my dad My dad was a, a typical African. You did as you were told. That was it. You didn't answer back. You didn't question. You just did as you were told. And that was it. It's changed days now, Michael. Oh, yeah. Fucking hell, man. The, the shit that you see nowadays. Do you see the change from oh. the 40s to, to now? Well... I, 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 my sister-in-law has got dementia in the States and her own kids won't look after her. She's coming over here to live over here with her, Sharon's sister. And to think that children won't look after their mother when she's ill, I just couldn't countenance such a thing. Just could not think that my mother was ill, I wouldn't look after her. What do you think's missing from this generation? Discipline. It was, I mean, when you got disciplined, <laughs> you didn't like it. But now I appreciate and I understand why my parents were as strict as they were. When's the first time you get into trouble? I say the first time I got into real trouble was the dance hall fight. We were told we didn't want niggers coming up dancing with our women. And that was it. I mean, I said to the barrister at the time, we, we, five, we all got... Uh, pleaded not guilty at Liverpool Crown Court, St. George's Hall. And um, they gave us, mother couldn't afford a solicitor or a barrister. So they gave us what they called the doc brief, which is a barrister who dealt with you all for a standard fee. And he came downstairs and he said, look, you're all being very silly. You can all be home. You've been in custody now because we've been in custody for three months. Got my 16th birthday in, in, in Walton Prison in a men's prison because I was in a boys' remand home. But once again, the nigger thing, fighting every day, and sent me to Walton Prison. And I had my 16th birthday at Walton, Walton Prison, in the men's prison. And the barrister said, you've all been in custody now for three months. You can all be at home with your families, plead guilty, you'll all get probation. We all stupidly changed our plea to guilty and we all got Borstal two years. And that was it. That was the start of it. Does that make you anti authority then? Do they set you up? Well, w when you've got a record at that age, it's hard to live it down. And I couldn't get a job. So people I'd met in prison 
came with graft. I started grafting, that was it. What sort of grafting? You're talking hash, you're talking... No, talk, snatches, blags. Robberies? Yeah. Cash in transit. That was it. You must look at it now, obviously, with all the cameras and CCTV oh, compared to back to, then, no DNA, no fingerprints. Nothing. Yeah, they had no chance. Once you hit the place, once you got out safe, it was over. How much you talking back then for your robberies? Well, we're getting like five grand a piece, which is big money in those days. I mean, like 1976, uh, I came out of prison in 74, and I got invited on, on a bit of graft and ended up getting 60 grand, which was <laughs> good money in 1976. I bought a Jensen Interceptor. Um, and life was good. Because back then everything's paid cash. You don't yeah. have credit cards. You don't have people, no, no. everybody with cash in hand. What was it like doing your first turn? <sighs> Borstal was bad because of racism. Because I remember the first day I actually got to Everthorpe Borstal. You, you got there in the afternoon and they locked you up and then they opened you up for tea. And uh, I remember they opened me up and says, all right, food. And I got to the top of the stairs and a chant started, banging the knives and forks on the table. Nigger, 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 nigger. 99 voices. I was the only black person on the wing. I had to fight it every day, every single day. But I survived. I survived it. I excelled even. Yeah. How did you survive it then with everybody against you? Was there anyone on your favour? Or was everybody just following the crowd? Crowd, for the crowd. I mean, they didn't want it. Nobody wanted to talk, talk to me and things like that. But... I mean, that, Liverpool, being so racist, prepared me for this. It prepared me for the things like that. Yeah. But I haven't forgotten. I haven't forgotten. Yeah, it's sad to think that people, it's not as if, it's sad to think people feel as if it needs to prepare them, but it then, how much anger and hate do you then have towards others do you feel sorry for him or do you think I'm going to get you back one day? No, I, I, I was, that prepared me and I said, look, no matter what happens, I'm going to do well. I'm going to make money. I'm going to make my family proud. And that was it. What did your mum and dad say when you went to Boston? Well, they were shocked because as I say, nobody had ever been in trouble before and that was it. And when you get sent to the adult prison, what was life like for you then? <sighs> Was that worse or was that a bit easier? Well, no, easier because I was locked up 23 hours a day. Out for an hour's exercise and that was it, locked up. But a uh, horrible place, horrible place. The screws were racist and that's it. What happens when you get out for the first time in prison? Well, say when I got out, I tried for jobs and no chance. And as I say, I bumped into a couple of people that I knew from Highton who were grafters. And they said, uh, would you like a bit of graft? Said, okay. And that was it. What was it like doing your first robbery? Were you, were you buzzing or were you scared? Or were you thinking that mentality, you're trying to do something with your life, even though it's the wrong thing, but were you thinking, I'm not going to suffer again? Well, the thing is, the police presence was very low in those days. No cameras, no nothing like that. And... Once you actually hit the job and got away, that was the end of it. Unless somebody made a stupid mistake, that was the end of it. What was the feeling like after you got away with your first one? Were it was thinking, nice because I, I think I ended up with about two, two and a half grand or something like that. And I had to sort of slide it into my mum's purse and things like that and pretend I'd got a little job uh, that was paying money and things like that. Is that what started then the lifelong life of crime? Oh, without a doubt. 
without a doubt. When I saw the money that was available, that was it. When was the next time you went to prison? Next time I went to prison was, I think it was, I got three years for um, robbery. Caught? How did you get caught? We we actually did the job. Everything was okay, and somebody, the money was um, brand new money, and one of the guys gave some to his wife. She went out and bought something, and it got sussed, and they arrested her, arrested him. He blew us up, and that was it. Yeah. See, because you were in the, the papers and stuff, the White Rose, Rolls Royce, they said in The Godfather. Yeah. When did you buy the White Rolls Royce? I bought the Rolls Royce in 1976. Was that a mistake? Or? Looking back, yes, it was a mistake. It rubbed the nose in it too much. Yeah. They hated it. They hated it. <laughs> and especially during the riots, when I used to attend meetings with Michael Heseltine, in a white Rolls Royce, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the, we, we we turned up once actually in the same suit. Uh, I had a silk suit, um, which was Guido Mil, and he had the same suit on. And he said, "Well, I know how much you paid for that." <laughs> yeah. So when when did the riot start? Was it eighty one? Eighty one, yeah. And what happened with the riots? Because Liverpool was in it was in a lot of poverty then, a lot oh, yeah. of unemployment. Yeah, I think same as. Same as Glasgow and stuff. We were going through a struggle back then in the 80s. Well, so my mum and dad says I was born in the 80s, but I never seen much of it. Well, as I said, the riots kicked off. And at that time, I was living in a place called Tubrook. And um, no, I was. I, I, I bought the big house then. I bought the big house in um, Chilwell. Did you pay cash? It, yeah, paid cash. How much? 32 nine fifty. And I paid 38 for the rolls. <laughs> so that was it. Um, bought my dad a house. Mum had one. That was it. So when did you start doing the puff? Uh, 70, 75. So you were already doing graft before all yeah. the rights and stuff? Yeah. So you, well, were on, you were on your feet then in the I was, I was settled then. I was settled. I, I, I didn't need money then. Because, as I say, when they offered me a job, I said, I don't need a job. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, see, when you got the White Rolls Royce, is that a case of, fuck you, I told you I would do something, even though things like that, you know yourself, being flash, it comes back and bites you in the ass, because oh, it yeah. then raises questions and yeah. alarm bells start ringing how he got that. Was that a fuck you to the people who try to bully and the yeah. racism and to show them, I told you I would do something with yeah. my life? Without a doubt. And how was that feeling when you had the bought house and the, the paid car? The Rolls Royce driving about, being a top boy, it, basically. It, it felt good. It felt good. What was the surveillance like back then in the, in the 70s and 80s? Obviously, you get your soccer now and everything's... Well, and the it, coppers know everything. Unless they actually caught you at it, there's nothing they could do. Nothing they could do. As I say, like, in 76, when, they, when I, I was going out the airport with the money, nothing they could do. Mm-hmm. Because back then, you you're no mobile phones. You yeah. know, there's no much trace of paper trail. No. Simple life back then, isn't it, Michael? Much simpler, <laughs> much easier. So what was it like, the rise? Did you ever come across Thatcher or anything? Well, what happened, I, I was driving along Parliament Street and a police roadblock, they stopped me. They said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to my father's house. My father lived in Liverpool later. And she will move, you black bastard. I said, who the hell do you think you're talking to? And I got out the car. And an um, uh, inspector came across. He said, no, get back in your car. And I said, so I found out that there was an organization called Liverpool 8 Defense Committee in the Charles Wooten Center, which was a black adult education center. And they were fighting cases. Because uh, what the police were doing, they were, getting young kids, beating them up and throwing them outside the hospital. And so we had mothers who didn't know where their kids were, 12 and 13 year old kids had just vanished overnight. Nobody knew they were, and then they found out the next day they were in the hospital. So we started the organization 
and we actually fought of the 66 percent of cases that we actually fought we won and we got black barristers from london michael mansfield all people like that to fight cases because we had one case i remember there was one case of a guy called um G uh, johnny F jimmy phillips and they arrested him having petrol saying he was going to make petrol bombs and what it was it was a, a water can and it used to be a petrol can and all they did they tested the headspace and said it was petrol and they actually did him on that and the barrister of course got the vi the um fluid checked and it was actually water which was using to top up his radiator and uh we won, as uh, 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 66% of the cases that we actually took on, we won. And they hated it. They hated it. What was the riots like in 81? Oh, I felt so proud when I saw what was happening. Because I thought, at last, at last it's happened. Because some of the things we used to see, we used to see the police... Uh, pull up outside a pub called the Alex, which was on Upper Hill Street. And the get black guys used to pay pitch and toss, you know, nearest the wall and things like that. And they'd just jump out the jeeps and batter them and arrest them for absolutely nothing. And of course, when that happened, everybody thought, yes, yes. Yeah. See, in the 80s, then you're flying high, everything's paid, you're looking after your mum and dad. People around you are doing well. Your yeah. circle's small. Yeah. I read that your, you always kept your circle small. Yeah. When did it come on top for you? It was after I was offered the job. Um, I, I was actually called to a, a place called Graham House, which is just by the Crown Court in Liverpool. And there was a man called Dewey Rees and another man who was the head of the Heseltine Task Force and they contacted a man called Rashid Mufti, who was a college lecturer who was on our committee. And they said they wanted to speak to me. I went down with Rashid and they said they'd like me to resign from the defense committee. And they'd give me a job in the Manpower Services Commission, a well-paid job. And I said, well, I'm not in it for a job. I, I don't need money. And after that, that's when all the problems started. And I was working then in the um, Merseyside Immigration Unit. And a client of mine came and said, because I got his dad, his entry clear, his uncle, his entry clearance into Britain. And he wanted entry clearance for a wife he just married him back in Pakistan. And I said, no problem. I should do that. But unknown to me, he was actually shipping heroin in and the customs were on it and the customs followed him to the immigration advice unit where i worked and from there that's where it all started because when he was actually arrested collecting the heroin they said look we've followed you here we've followed you there you went to the immigration advice unit yes i went to see a man called mikhail michael to get entry clearance for my wife blah 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 he got my uncle his entry clearance the tape goes off five hours later the tape comes back on again i now wish to tell the truth the man called mikhail was supposed to i was supposed to give the heroin to to sell for my uncle and that was it that was his evidence he gave in court so set up you got a 20 stretch for that i got 24 yeah what was it the stage you're getting the brown from Pakistan. Pakistan. And in fact, the brown was being supplied to British custom officers by British, by Pakistani drug smugglers. And it was all part of a big conspiracy. And they were actually convicted of the sale of heroin, the custom officers, and they got six months probation i stood in court and watched them get six months probation and heard the judge say we don't want to do too much to to jeopardize your pensions yeah. so 
See, before that, what were you selling, hash? Or was some, it weed? It's, it's some, and what's called ganja? How much were you shipped? Because were you working in the docks or was your family working no, in no, the docks? No, uh, no. Uh, one of our firm had an uncle who was in, in charge of the unions. And anything that came in, they could bring the port to a standstill. And anything that went on, they knew about it. And that was it. And I used to ship it in tin containers, compress it into the container, seal it, and put it in half a ton container. That was it. How much were you paying back then, a kilo? 300 pounds a kilo. Uh, no, 300 pounds a pound in those days. Half a kilo? Yeah. Just, yeah, just under that. Yeah. It's crazy, though, isn't it? 300 yeah. quid. Yeah. How much were you selling back home? Back home? 600, 700? A ton. Yeah, how much were you charging? A kilo? Oh, no, it was 300 pound a, a, a pound we were selling. Yeah. That, two, was it 2.2 a kilo on it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's how, man. Back in the day, when you think it's easy, if you've got, because I had Andrew Pritchard on, but they were paying a million pounds to customs to yeah. get the shipments through. And they had to catch the odd one every few months as well, just yeah. to make it as if they were doing their job. But they were getting a million just to pass it through. But they were shipping a thousand, two thousand kilo of yeah. coke back then as well. So it was big shipments, but they were making that up tenfold. Well, that's what annoyed me because mm. I was offered brown. When I used to go to London, take the weed to London. And I had people say, listen, just take two key. I said, look, I, I don't know anybody who's involved in it, which I didn't. And anybody who was involved in them was sort of shunned in those days because people didn't like it. And rightly so. Yeah, it was a destruction that caused yeah. and the pain. And to this day, it's the, the prisons that are full of it and the pain yeah. and the addictions and... So you only done the puff, I thought you'd done the smack as well, I thought nope. you were in, no. Nah. So nope. that, because it obviously says you got your 20 and you've yep. always pleaded your innocence yep. because it was a set up certain phone calls for Pakistan, but yep. what do you think of the karma situation? You were doing graft anyway, you never get caught for that, but you yep. get caught for, do you feel as if they were going well, to throw that, you under the bus? Well, the thing is, I, that's one of the things that kept me going on the 20. I thought to myself, well, look at all you got away with it. And that's it. And I sort of rationalised the sentence that way. I mean, it was actually declared a miscarriage of justice by the Criminal Cases Court uh, Review Commission in 19, no, in 2006. But of course, they couldn't let me win. They could not let me win. That's the only thing with the other side. They do always win. Yeah. No matter what. And like we spoke earlier when cameras were off, they know everything. Yeah. nowadays especially especially with the technology they can simple fucking bug in a car or your phones are tapped or it's just too it's too easy to find out information nowadays so see when you're get, get, did you know you were getting a 20 stretch or were you thinking you're going to walk from it did you know no i was i was worried because they'd stitched me up so well i thought well, that, that's it i had, I had myself uh, puzzled did i do it and it was so, the stitch up was so good. And what's going through your mind when they say 20 years? Well, uh, when, when, when I actually got the 20, I'm trying to work out how much, how long do I actually do? It was 14 and yeah, working out how long you actually did. What age were you then? I was um, 30 odd then. What prison did you go to? Full Sutton. I was in, in the unit in um, Hull first. While I was on remand with, um, what's his name? Oh, what's his name? Charlie. Cray? No. Bronson? Charlie Bronson, yeah. And uh, Lord Longford used to go and visit him there. He had him do impressives, actually. And uh, Charlie said, he said, oh, he said, yeah, listen, no matter what you get, you do it. You'll do it. He said, it'll be hard, but you'll do it. And that was it. He must have thought he was getting out then because he only got a six or a seven yeah. at the start. Yeah. What was Charlie Bronson like at the start when he just went to prison? Was well, he, he was, a madman then? or he, he was a character. He was a character and a half. And that's it. What do you think that is with him? Do you think he's maybe scared to, to get out? With the damage he's done on there? Or do you just think he just hates the, everybody? Not everybody, but anti-authority. I mean, he hates just, the system. Yeah. Yeah. 
but he is the system. Yeah. He's prime example of what happens in the system if you don't follow the rules. Nobody wants to follow rules. Rules are there to be broken, but when you're in the system, if you don't abide by their rules, they'll break you and break you and break. They can break every bone, but as soon as they break that spirit, you've seen it yourself in yeah. prison, you're, you're, you, you may as well be dead. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because like, you were in with so many, you were in with the great train robbers. Yeah, I mean, when I got the seven, I was in with the um, train robbers, uh, Cray Firm, Eddie Richardson, I knew them all because only like 21 then, 22. And that was it. What was Eddie Richardson like? Nice fellow. But they hated the crazy, they were, they, they fought? They got well in, they got on well inside. That's weird that, isn't it? Yeah. So you were okay then? Did you, were you, did you find it easy to make friends as you got older and you had the reputation? Yeah. Whether, did the racism stop? Oh, was not, no racism in the, in the adult prisons. Mm -hmm. None in the adult prisons, no. Did that make life easier for you? Oh, either? much easier. Much easier. What goes through your mind when you think you're free and you've... Listen, money gives you freedom. We understand that. And you, you're trying to do the right things. Listen, the life of destruction and robberies and drugs, we know it destroys lives. Yeah. But at that time, that's what served you because that's the only way you think yeah. how to survive. What was it like your first year? Did, did it really hit home that you were doing a 20 stretch and kind of everything falls apart oh, yeah. when you're in i mean uh, my my youngest child was um well she was born while i was in on remand and so i didn't really know her and that hurt me my my son's daughters I mean, it, it was sad seeing them like once a month and then once every two weeks or whatever, but that was it. Because did your first wife not, did you not pay for the house cash and she fucked off with it? Yeah. <laughs> that's the, I'm laughing because that's what happens. That's, yeah. It's the classic manoeuvre. She was a cow. <laughs> that was it. And uh, as I said, she, she, um, she divorced me while I was in prison. Mm -hmm. and uh, wouldn't let me see the children, things like that. What about, who was it that was killed in a car chase? Was anybody killed in your family in a car chase? No, my son was actually killed. Well, my mum died in a car, uh, uh, in, as being hit by a stolen car while I was on remand, mm -hmm. and they wouldn't let me go to a funeral. Uh, my son, he drank some uh, Bacardi, which was actually pure cocaine. His girlfriend had gone to Jamaica, and as far as I'm concerned, she'd she'd had a little fling with a Jamaican, and he gave her two bottles of rum to bring back, and gave her a phone number to phone when he got back to, when she got back to England, and she gave a bottle of rum away to the gardener in the hotel they were staying at, and brought a bottle home, and that was it. My son drank some. That was it. He died. What about your mum? How's that then when you're in remand and your mum's been killed? Well, I, remember, I always remember the morning. Cause they came to me about one o'clock in the morning and they said to me, is your mother named Daisy Pretoria? And then I knew something was wrong. And they just told me, put me on the phone to my wife and she told me my mum had been killed by a stolen car. What was it? Was there ever any justice for that? <sighs> yeah. The guy who did it, his barrister said, this unfortunate lady has sons who are well known in a criminal fraternity. Can you imagine what would happen if you send this young man to prison? That was it. So he got away with killing yeah. your mum because of who and you were? he also killed a student doctor two years later again stolen car yeah. so you can through all that then your life with the racism the hate towards black people yeah. just your mum being killed losing your son did it ever come on top where you felt as if I don't want to take anyone and think about taking your own life or did you have so much hate and rage to then just... No, I, 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 I've always thought, I'm going to get out. 
I'm going to do well. And that's it. I'll show them. And that was it. Did you feel as if making money eased the pain or whatever you were battling within? Yeah, it did. It did. It made it, made it easier to survive. And that was it. What was the craze like in prison? Well, as I say, Reggie, I was in with, and he used to like hooch. <laughs> he used to like the hooch. I used to have a drink myself. And um, he was a typical old Cockney. Typical old Cockney. Fuck him. That was it. <laughs> yeah. Nice fellow was Reggie. Who was the maddest person you were in prison with? I think Charlie. Charlie Bronson. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a few men on who's been in with him. He took the hostages and put yeah. one under his bed. They told him to tickle his feet. He wanted a helicopter. Yeah. He has a he has a nutcase. I hope he, he does get it. I believe he does deserve a chance to get it. Listen, he could be back in the next day. But to be spending 40, 50 years, whatever it is, he's inside yeah. for a robbery. There's people out there kill kids, get fucking less. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Give the guy a chance. But I don't know his social work reports. I don't know what his mental health's like. It could be it could be worse. But as far as I'm concerned, he's still a, as far as I'm told, he's still a big fat, strong man. Yeah. But if he, what was did he ever did you ever see him fighting with the screws? No. They they left him alone. They knew him and they kept well away. That was it. What's the worst thing you've seen in prison, Michael? People hang themselves. I'll tell you what, what they uh, made me laugh once was um, Frankie Fraser. I was down the block and he shit a screw up. <laughs> they opened the door and he had shit in his hand and he pushed it under his mouth, up his nose, and everywhere. The screw was vomiting every, everywhere. Yeah, Frankie Fraser. He was proper, wasn't he? Yeah. He was a proper old fucking psycho. Yeah. He was a gangster, wasn't he? Yeah. He, he lived and breathed that life. That's what he wanted. And that, who is, is it? Oh, it's Freddie Foreman. Who's still alive? Is it? I think Freddie Foreman's still alive. Foreman's yeah. still alive, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, Roger Bender. Yeah. What was uh, Roy Shaw like? Just an honest, gym minded person. That was it. Because he could scrap her. Yeah. Did you ever see him scrap in prison? No, I saw very few fights in prison, actually. If you pulled Sykes, it was a regular one, but to me, I'd say everybody, I mean, Paul, Paul was a nutter like Charlie. Yeah. It's mad, isn't it? The, the names that you came across and how they're, I saw a lot of their names still live on with their stories and people still speaking about them. Yeah. Do you look back and think that because they're all dead now, like how fast life goes as well? Oh, yeah. See when you were see after you got your twenty and then you done fourteen, fifteen years, what was the plan to come out? Was it straight back on the graft, especially with the, the contacts you've then got? Yeah. You're in working with the that top end people mm -hmm. in the underworld, the people who's got connections and can open doors to any fucking thing you want. Was that planning to then come back out and just flood the streets? Well, I, I did a, a bit of job with uh, with um, Roy. Oh God, I forgot his surname. The little racing driver in the train robbers. Um, can't remember his surname, but I used to get um, ash off him, sell it in Liverpool, take the money up to him. That was it. What's the worst prison you've been in? I think Strange Ways. How? The screws were officious, barbaric, petty. Yeah. Did you ever have any riots inside? No, no. I went to Strange Ways. We were one of the first prisoners to go in there after the riots. Yeah. What did you do once you came out? After your 20 stretch? Well, I was banned from Liverpool when I first came out. Um, I had to get permission from the Home Office to visit mother's grave and my son's grave. Um, and then fortunately I met my now wife, Sharon, and life became rosy. Because how many kids have you got? 11 as well? Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
I thought I had a lot, Michael. <laughs> does that, how hard is it then when you're in prison, knowing that you've got kids and stuff and you've lost your mum and you've lost your son? When does it all hit home that the life that you were in as well? Do you ever feel like the victim or do you feel as if karma always plays a part as well? How do you see it, life, for you, from your eyes? Well, I don't think it's karma um, because to think it's karma, I would have to think I was doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. I thought, as far as I was concerned, I was just working to survive. And that was it. Like the robberies and stuff, obviously, but because it, everything has that effect. If there's women in there, there are children in robberies, then it scars them as well for life. You know what I mean? I'm not talking about losing lots. Of, we should never lose people. If we could live the be perfect life, we would never lose people the way we want to lose them. But the sad reality is this is life, and we lose people just in a heartbeat, and you realise, shit, man, I wish I was a bit nicer or yeah. more connected to them. Do you have regret where you wish you'd have been closer and more understanding towards, especially being in prison as a mother's instincts is to try and keep her son away from trouble. Yeah. Do you have a regret that you were in prison when it well, happened to your mum? Without a doubt. Because, I mean, to actually not, I mean, to actually be sitting in a cell while your mother's being buried, I mean, that was hell. That was hell. What was it like going to the graves when you came out? Oh, that, that uh, chewed me up. Especially, well, I actually saw my mother's grave when we buried my son, because we buried him with my mum. And that was the first time I saw my mum's grave, yeah. Did you get out for your son's funeral? No. No. What were you, cat A? No, sorry, I got out for my, my son's funeral. It's mum's funeral I didn't get out for. Mm -hmm. I was actually a cat C. I could have been released for my son's funeral. I could have been released, but. Be handcuffed? Yeah. That's the thing as well, and it's just, yeah. <clears throat> but at least you were there. Yeah. Do you think you would have caused a riot if you never got out? Well, that was the reason they said that they wouldn't let me go to my mother's funeral because I could cause riots. You know, which is nonsense anyway, because people respected my mum, respected me, and that was it. Nothing would have happened. Because Noel Razor Smith was a good friend of mine. He was a notorious bank robber from London and his son passed away. The priest came. He told the priest to fuck off because he knew something was bad was about to be said and it was he lost his son and they never let him go. Yeah. And he was going to... He, I asked, that was the thing that changed his life because he was going to riot. He was just, fuck it, turn and just absolutely cause it. Probably spent the rest of his life in prison but something happened that month where he decided he wanted to change. I think he went to Grendon. Yeah, and, uh, learned, my brother went there. Learned how to read and write, and he became a publisher, amazing man. And it shows you sometimes the dark stuff in life and the pain in life can actually, even though it's full of hate and rage you can have, it can actually turn that into power, motivation, success, love. It can totally twist and turn. See, when you came out and you went to the graves and... What happened with life after that? Well, the thing is, I, I, I saw all my children and I thank God for them. And as I say, I'd met Sharon then and we had a child and that was it. Life just changed completely. For the better? For the better. Did you see when it came, when it was about money, that how ruthless people we could be, even loved ones? Oh, yeah. No two ways about it. Allegedly, how much was moving through your hands when you were at the top? Millions. Millions. Were you ever satisfied? Well, no, because you never see it coming to an end. You never think, well, if I have two million, that'll be enough. Three million, that'll be enough. You just, money's coming so easy. You don't, you don't take question it. When did you end up in Africa? Uh, 70s. Like 74, 75, 76, 77. What made you go there? Well, I went actually because of the police attention. It got the crime squads used to actually sit outside my house. As soon as I drove off, they'd drive behind me. As soon as I stopped, they, they were no bones about it. They weren't making any bones about it at all they just followed me everywhere and 
it got to the point I said, that's too much. So I thought, well, I'll go and visit my dad's family, have a break, which I did. And while I was out there, I bumped into a seaman and he said, brother, he said, can you help me? He said, I, my ship go to Liverpool and I take Igbo, which is weed, and I don't know anybody who can buy it. I said, well, no problem. I said, give me your name, ship, dates, which he did. And I phoned people in Liverpool. They went off on board, bought the weed. That was it. And from there, I thought, well, this is a good business. Put some on myself. Took it out, out, out okay. Sold it. I thought, this is too easy. And that was it. It was it 60 grand you made your first yeah. first shipment? Yeah. Are you then thinking game time? Yeah. And then you end up doing what you do, go to the top of the ladder, end up with a 20 stretch, come back out. You end up in prison again? Yeah. Was that was it Turkey? Turkey. What happened? I went to visit a friend of mine whose wife had just had a baby because I was working then in Sainsbury's in the warehouse. And as a matter of fact, I was 10 years in Sainsbury's warehouse. <laughs> and... My friend, his wife had just had a baby, so I thought, well, I'll go across and see him. I went across to see him. Unknown to me, he's grafting on the brown. When I went to the house, he wasn't there. His wife, she couldn't speak much English. She said, magic, not here, magic. So I said, well, okay. I gave her the presents for the children, told her the hotel I was staying at, and that was it. About four days later, my hotel door comes in, soldiers storm in with stub machine guns. That was it. They'd nicked him with a um, 22 kilo in a tire. And what they do in Turkey, when they're on observation, everybody who goes to that house is photographed and arrested at the time that the suspect is arrested, which I was one of the people. So, of course, they contacted Liverpool, and Liverpool said, oh, yes, yes, he's into heroin, he's into heroin, and that was it. Even though I'd, I hadn't been in trouble for 10 years, and I was working as a warehouseman, that was the shit they came up with. How much did you get? I got 10 years. So you got a 20 stretch and a 10 stretch yeah. for smack, yeah. and you were never dealing with that? that? That's, that's what hates. Because obviously looking from the outside, the coppers would thinking, you're just making shit up. It's hard to believe yep. a man who was active, top of the tree, driving a white Rolls yep. Royce in Africa, doing shipments over to the docks to Liverpool, to the two times you do get caught with phone calls in Turkey, people are going to think, well, he's just blatantly caught and he's not, he's not admitting it. Yeah. Does that hurt? It hurts. It hurts. I'm, I'm, and what hurts is that the people in Liverpool, eight, know I wasn't involved in heroin. Because they knew all the people involved in heroin. And that's it. Yeah. So where did you do your 10? In a, a place called Maltepe. Which, I mean, Turkish prisons are totally different because when you go in, you get a blanket, a mattress, and a pillow. That's it. Spoon, cup, saucer, food, everything else you have to buy yourself. If you have no money, you get nothing. Nothing. Get food uh, three times a day and minimal food. And that's it. Any trouble in the Turkish prisons? Yeah, it's, it, it's very, very gang orientated. I mean, the first um, wing I was on was run by um, uh, Macedonians and Russians and a lot of um, racism from the Eastern Europeans and I got thrown off a couple of wings I ended up on a, a, an Arab wing which wasn't too bad but uh, pff, hell hell on earth what are you then thinking if you're, you're working in Sainsbury's trying to be a family man you say you met the, the love of your life again that not fuck up but again the, the misery you've caused the people who love you how did your wife handle that? And why did she well, stick by you? She stuck by me because she loved me, she loved our son, and loved our life, and that was it. 
how hard is that for you to be in there? Because you're very emotional today, and it's it's a good thing as well because it's a release. But I don't know if it's a build up or maybe you get emotional all the time. But how hard is that to 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 see that? when the people you love because it's mad because I always say that's just because you're a criminal or done bad things it doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad person yeah. it's just that life that environment where you think it's normal it's not to you yeah actually some day you have some people call it a spiritual awakening or just an awakening to realize what the fuck was i doing but how hard is that to see your wife who's you then think it's come in and, and is the one who then makes you see the world differently to them being back in prison did you have to explain to her or did she not know it was? But she knew, she knew I wasn't at it. She knew I wasn't at, at the heroin, and it hurt. As I say, with her being so loyal, it hurt even more because I'd never had such loyalty. What age were you then? <sighs> mm, the age sixty. Sixty. Hmm? Fuck's sake, Michael. So see when you're working in Sainsbury's and stuff, how was that life from White Rolls Royce, buying houses, cash, everybody loving you because they think you're the man about town, to then be working in Sainsbury's? Was it a better feeling working in Sainsbury's? Or it was it was better because there was no worries. There was no worries about people knocking on my door because I knew I wasn't at it. But then again, you don't have to think you're at it. If they think you're at it, that's it. Did anybody ever try and test you in Sainsbury's? No, uh, there'd th been a couple of television programmes and things like that and people sort of knew what it was about. And that was it. Why do you think people choose a life of crime? <sighs> I chose it because it was the only way out. And that's it. And because it was... Uh, very fruitful. Yeah, the, the external stuff. Yeah. It's crazy, though, isn't it? Because it does always come back and bite in the ass. And seeing you're in the Turkish prison, how long did you actually do for, for, for your time? Six years and eight months. So it's not even half over there either? No, no it's two thirds. Do you get any home leaves or anything in Turkey? Is it... Yes. You af After you... Um... When you've got, to, I think, I can't remember what was I did, but like after I had two years left, they moved me to what they call an open prison, which is like machine guns on the wall. And every month or every three months, you allowed seven days leave. And my wife used to come to um, their holiday resorts and I used to go and spend time with them a week. Yeah. What was that like, getting your whole first home leave in Turkey? Uh, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. What's the happiest moment in your life, Michael? My last child being born. Yeah. Because I knew it would be my last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good number to stop me at yeah. 11. It's, uh, why did you know it would be your last? Well, I was uh, nearly 60 and that was it. How do you look so good for someone who's nearly 80? You're very so. smart. Your tie is absolutely spot on, man. How you've done that tie is, is amazing. I, I think prison. Prison, where you keep fit because you have to, and it's your sanity. That's it. You keep sane by being fit. Do you think survival mode? Yeah. Learning the basics, yeah. traits and tools mm. to keep fit and keeping your mind sharp? Yeah. There were no gyms in Turkey. Yeah. You just had to, yeah, like... Just press-ups. Stones on bars and things like that. Yeah. See, having that, I feel some reputation and people think you're the big man and you're the big-time drug dealer. Do you think that can damage a man to having that false kind of security that people think... That looks an amazing life because I used to look up to the people who had the convertibles back in the day. I was like 12, 13. They used to have the convertibles, the big blondes in the passenger seat, driving about in escort convertibles. And I think, wow, I wanted that life. Yeah. And then 10 years, 15 years later, the blondes are haggard looking, they're damaged looking. Yeah. The men are in and out of prison, the big deals, 100 grand deals, that half a million deals turn into 10 grand, and then it's five grand, then it's a grand. 
and then they can't get back what they've lost but you always lose yeah. do you see that as well there's never a winner I think I realised after the 20 that you couldn't win you couldn't win and that was it how long did it take to get back from Turkey did you have to stay there once you get released or could you go no, back? No, once I got passport? released, actually, I was actually going to be rearrested because the British Embassy wouldn't help me. They wouldn't let me get my passport because my passport had run out. And the Turkish authorities were going to arrest me because I had been in Turkey for 28 days and I should have gone. And with my wife, actually, who got onto the MP here, that pushed things. What was it like coming back again? Did you have to feel as if you were starting again in your 60s? Yeah. Yeah. My wife was at the airport with my son and her friend, and that was it. How do you then change from that life, Michael? Because a lot of people can't get out. How hard is it to actually get out and go, listen, I've spent over 30 years in prison. I've seen loved ones die, come and go. I've not been to their funerals. The pain's always there, but how hard is it to then try and hold back that anger and frustration towards life, towards the bullies, towards the criticism, towards the people always try to bring you down? How hard is it to then try and flip that, to be a family man, to work in Sainsbury's, to try and do the right thing? Was it a hard transition? I didn't find it actually hard. I, I, I just took to it <laughs> like a doctor water. It was just natural. That's it. And I, I, I was getting a decent wage because I was like, I was on like eleven pound an hour then, which was good even today. Yeah, I think people are only thirteen, fourteen quid yeah. now. Do you? What do you? Do you miss that? Was graft? Yeah. Yes. I missed the freedom of the money, and that's it. I don't miss the risk or the worry. But I miss the freedom of the money. I mean, I, I would, I would love to be able to give my 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 present wife, the life that I gave my first wife. But the thing about a good woman is, well, she's just not interested. They in don't care just about. It. They don't care for that yeah. life. They're just happy you're sitting here. Yeah. They're just happy you're on the couch watching shit TV, yeah. taking your dog a walk. That's winning. The beautiful thing is, the simple things in life, and as cheesy as it is, the best link things in life are free. Yeah. Connection, love, honesty, if we can get it, food in the belly. <clears throat> I know a lot of people struggle, but if you've got the basic things, you can actually have a good life. But because you've lived the high-end life, it's hard to give it up because you know how to get there. Yeah. And that's the thing. But to give that up and realise, listen, I, there's no point in trying to get there because you lose it anyway. Look at the proceeds of crime. Look at people are getting 30s now just for association 25 years just for certain people saying well, look at the phone the, calls the, um, yeah the phone calls yeah and then you're talking there um what's the phones the people are using there encrypted fucking yeah i mean I, I i people came to me and said you want one i said no i said because i don't talk business on the phone mm -hmm. that's it yeah, because you're getting people are just getting done for the phones now. Yep. What are the phones, man, called? Encros. Encro yeah, chats. It was the encro yeah. chats and people I know people it's hard to fuck off. And I think like as some law in France they never had the right to do so far. I yeah. think a lot of things are getting but people were already doing a 10, 15 and now. Yeah. I know people's get big court cases next year, but hopefully things will get overturned. Because listen, you don't mind people getting caught fair play, but it's the yeah. corruption that comes with yeah. it. And there's the Met police there. They've just had to release a thousand Met coppers. There's only 34,000, but they've released a thousand, which is one in 34 for corrupt coppers, yeah. abuse, rape, corruption. Do you know what I mean? There's a lot of fucking dirtiness in with the Met police as well. And any coppers, listen, there's good coppers as well. There's genuinely people trying to clean up the streets. Now, I've got kids, and I wouldn't want them doing the bad shit that I've done or the people I speak no, to no. do. No, that, That's the one thing I'm happy about. None of my children have ever gone through what I went through. Why do you think that is? <sighs> because well, I was strict with them. The mums were strict with them, and that's it. Mm -hmm. How hard is it having so many kids to different women? <sighs> it's, 
it's hard because some of the mothers hate you and turn the kids against you. And you want relationships with your own children, but you can't have them. Because the older I get, I just realise it's all about family. Yeah. You keep that tribe strong. You keep that family not in line, but there's got to be discipline to yeah. under. I've lived a fucked up life. You've lived that. You've lived longer on this planet to see it longer than me. And it's, but that's the destruction that you can cause back then because you don't see, you don't think 10, 20, 30 years down the line. You're thinking yeah. in the moment with your dick and just try to be the big man and try to do the right thing. But then realising as time goes on, family for me is everything. Yeah. My kids are happy. I'm happy. They're fucking hard work. It's hard. There's no point in denying it and going, oh, I skipped down the road and everything's all great and rosy. Life is tough. No matter how much you make, no matter what level you're at successfully, there's just, the bottom line is you just have to get on with it. Try and learn and educate and learn from the mistakes to then try and pass it down for future generations. But as human beings, we're all different. We all see the world differently and that's what can be the beautiful thing about life because nobody knows, I say this all the time, but nobody knows what's going on, Michael. No. I genuinely don't think they do anyway. We can talk a good game. My job is talking, but I still don't know what the fuck I'm talking about half the time. Yeah. See, when you get out there in Turkey, try to do the right things, did, did you, how long have you been free? I think it's nearly 10 years now. How are you feeling now? Totally relaxed. Yeah. yeah. Why have you been so emotional today? Because the racism, as I say, which shaped my whole life is something which I hate and it does make me angry. Do you think you ever forgive those people? Or do you think... No, I don't think I'll ever forgive them. You'll die with the hate towards them? No. Did you ever get therapy in prison? Did you ever work on your like, emotions or anything? To come no, down in, from in, in those days, in those days, there was nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There was nothing. Because nowadays, everybody's the mental health yeah. right but listen again I get it it's good to talk it is yeah. but there comes a time when you need to just fucking get on with it get the head down and focus and push through because the talking is good but there's only so much talking you can do without actually putting it into action and that's important do you see a lot of changes nowadays with people talking out and talking about feelings and emotions compared to back then of course I mean everything's open now Mm -hmm. everything's open but as I say the, the, the main thing I see which is so different is the male female relationship and that's it yeah but nowadays everybody they want everybody a female yeah they don't want any masculinity they don't want any tough men strong men yeah. there's got to be balance there's two different genders for a reason there's two different energies there's two different there's different chromosomes, there's different genders for a reason, male and female, there's feminine energy, there's masculine energy. But it's like my wife couldn't understand the furore of that guy kissing the footballer. He was overcome by emotion, he kissed her, that's it, that's all it was. He didn't sexually assault her. But that's day and age, when you talk about, they're talking about toxic masculinity, yeah. they try to take it away, but again, it's nothing to do with people being toxic. The toxic thing is being weak and abusive and hateful. If you're masculine, you're strong, you're loving, you're caring. So people need to understand, stop trying to take the masculinity away from men. The world needs that. The world needs women as well. So yeah. both play their part, men and women. We need each other. Men build big skyscrapers. Women bring life into the world. And yeah. this is what it's all about. Be who you want to be. If you want to be a boss lady, if you want to do that and, and do your own thing and be independent listen good for you but men need men and women need women and, and we both need each other just to get through in life because life's i don't know do you feel do you feel as a family life is changing nowadays no not really because we're, we're the we're the old-fashioned family so that's it how was it speaking out when was the first time you ever spoke out did you do any news articles or anything? Yeah, there's, I mean, there's a few new, um, newspaper articles. 
I mean, I actually sh- spoke jo- out during the riots many times. What, yeah. what was it like speaking out and how stuff like this now and people see people talking about their past and their life? How does it feel? It feels odd in a way, um, but also nice and relaxing. Yeah. How was it writing a book? Oh, that that was emotional. A lot of emotion there. Yeah. Why do you think, what do you think changes racism? <sighs> Education. You've got to educate the young. To think people hate on other people from, from colour, even religion, you've got people hating on everybody. I think people are just feel a hate, yeah. but you've lived that life and you can still see the emotion, you can still see the passion, the hate yeah. and the love and see the people you grew up with, are they still around? Most of them are actually. <clears throat> yeah, most of them. We're, we're, we're fortunate, black people, because we tend to have longevity. That's it. Why do you think that is? I don't know, but it's the... Mm-hmm. I say most of my friends from school are still around. Yeah, because our dads knew each other, our mums knew each other, and that was it. What do you think looking back in your life, Michael? Well, there's many things I'd like to change, but you can't change the past, and that's it. What would you change? I'd have changed ever going to that dance. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. Do you feel as that was the, the thing that changed? Oh, that, that, whole, was, start of, that was the start of everything. That's it. Did you ever feel at peace in your life? Have you ever felt at peace? Yeah, I, I'm at peace now. That's it. I'm, I'm totally relaxed. And that's it. What's your daily routine like? I get up six o'clock, make my wife's breakfast, run a bath. That's it. Do shopping. That's it. Do you love your wife? Very much so. Very much so. What keeps a happy relationship? Well, I can't say not arguing because we do argue. I think that's normal. Um, I mean, just being at peace with each other, and that's it. I think communication's key. Yeah. Yeah, my message does my fucking head in. Yeah. So uh, I think arguments are healthy. She doesn't really argue, it's me. I get uptight sometimes, pressures of life. I tend to take it out into people around me. Yeah. And it's, uh, I'm learning. As I'm getting older, I believe I am chilling out a bit more. But I also believe I, sometimes a little bit of anger's got us where I am today as well. Because a lot of people who like to, you give them an inch and they like to take a mile. So sometimes you've got to have that little bit. Listen, dickhead, just, okay, I'm a good guy, but just be careful because just don't take the piss. Yeah. Did you feel as if, people knowing who you were working in Sainsbury's and stuff was a good thing because then because people can look down at others yeah he's had a fall from grace and do you know what I mean people want to see you fall flat in your ass but then not understanding just having freedom is a rich man's thing you're rich I believe anyway especially if you've tasted prison for so long as you have so even but we see people like to judge and what we wear or what we drive did you see that working in scenes? Did anybody ever laugh or go, oh, well, you deserve it? No, not really. I mean, I still drove a good car I, I, and I, I still dressed well, ate well, went out to restaurants, so they didn't see any difference, really. Why do you dress so well? You look great. Is that just get up and dress up? Well, it, it it's something I like to do. I've always liked to dress. And as I say, it's... It just comes natural to me. What's that knot called in your tie? Because that's the Windsor. Per- the Windsor knot. Yeah. That's the perfect knot. That's the one in it. You see, I, I do the old fashioned way we used to do our ties at school and you, it's all creased. But the Windsor knot's the one. When did you learn to do that? My dad taught me that was it. When did your dad pass? Uh, 1988, I think it was. Mm-hmm. No, nine, yeah, 19, let's see, two, 1900. No, it must be 1990, because it was 90 when he died. It's a good age as well, yeah. isn't it? <clears throat> so you've got good family genes then? Yeah. Strong? Mum mum got killed at 78. My mum's mum died at 100. And my dad's mum died at 106. So. <laughs> what was the nutrition? <laughs> Fufu. <laughs> was that? Yeah. Did you drink? Yeah. 
Rum? Brandy. Good old Brandy. Yeah. It's mad that my granddad was he was eighty six, I think, or eighty eight. But he used to he was still smoking hash. Yeah. So he was when he he went he was fucking smoking the hash at the, in his house. And he was still fat. He used to drive about and he was a mad old bastard, old Joe, my mum's dad. Um but he was the same. He he loved the hash. He smoked the hash right up until his day we went. Yeah. It's mad that. Where do you see us? Where do you go forward for the future, Michael? Oblivion. <laughs> yeah. It. Yeah, as I say, if I live to see my son, um, as I say, pass out as a barrister, I'll be very pleased. Because your son's just graduated, is that correct? No. He's, um, he's in his last year mm -hmm. of study now. How's that make you feel? It makes me proud that, um, and, and also it gives me hope because he doesn't know racism. He's never been called nigger. So that gives me hope. Yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah. Do you think now if the world is changing, like you say, there's still racism here, but it's, it's obviously calmed down a lot from back in oh, the day. From my day. Yeah. yeah. Do you know what I mean? Back in the day. But then again, there was still slaves and all that shit just not so long yeah. ago. You're talking maybe 60, 70 years yeah. ago in America. Yeah. America is bad for racism, but yeah. we don't stay in America. We stay in the UK. And like I say, in Scotland, I don't see it. I don't see it in the street. I don't see people fighting or arguing. The streets are pretty chilled now, but then I'm saying I don't see it because I'm up in Scotland. And But I don't know how it is. I can't speak for everybody. But the use, does that, because the racism thing where you're saying you can see the emotion clearly on your face and the torment and the torture you must have went through. But does that then, was that a worry that it could have just been like that for the rest of your life and your kid's life? Was that oh, yeah. always I mean, a concern? I, 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 it concerned me that my children would go through the same thing that I went through. But fortunately they haven't. That's it. And how many, and he's got a year left. He's, your son's got a year left yes. to graduate. Yeah. And is that a proud moment for you? Oh, it will be. What it is will, your, what it is, will be. What is your proudest moment so far, Michael? The birth of my last child. Yeah? Yeah. Why is that that one that sticks out? Do you feel as if you're I in a better place? I, I, I didn't think I'd have any more children. I didn't think I'd get involved um, emotionally or romantically, except for passing in the night. And then Sharon came along and that was it. Ain't it mad how women change their life? Yeah. Sometimes for the good lesson, sometimes for the worst yeah. as well. But that's for me is what it's all about. That's what I, I'm not trying to find the, the keys to life, but I'm trying to understand life where I can pass it on to people who watch these shows and listen to the shows. For me, it's all about family. Yeah. Build a family and keep the family strong. Make sure their brothers and sisters love each other and they're there for each other. Yeah. Because outside of that can be painful life. So when the shit hits the fan, if you've got a strong family unit, then you can handle anything. You're because when the shit hits the fan anyway, Michael, you know yourself, the ones who are at court as family, yeah. the friends ain't fucking there because either are shagging your bird yeah. or trying to get your contacts. Yeah. So for me, it's, listen, it's good to make money. It's good to have freedom. We get it. But... There is also people out there with nothing who can still be happier than anybody on this planet. Well, my daughter upset me because she's emigrating to uh, Australia now. She's just a baby. She's about six months old. And uh, her husband has got a job in Amazon in Australia. So they've got them a house and by the end of the year, she'll be in Australia. Yeah. But what she wants to do actually is to move to New Zealand in a couple of years. And settle in New Zealand. New Zealand's supposed to be beautiful. Yeah. But again, it seems a better life over there. Yeah. People are leaving for a reason. You've got the weather. You've got, I think it's the pay better income as well. Yeah. Um, better lifestyle. Listen, there's still bad shit happens in Australia, but Australia, not as much Australia as Australia's bad for racism. And they're just they were voting on a law the other day to give Aborigines rights. <laughs> That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. So see when your family go to other places, do you look do you look up to see if it's there's racism there? Oh yeah. I mean we went to a Dominican Republic um last November. And I like going to black countries 
but you could see the racism still where the lighter black people were always on the desk and things like that. And the darker black people had the sort of menial jobs. Yeah. It's fucking crazy, isn't it? Yeah. But again, it's <laughs> the world. I mean, Jamaica's a place for that as well. Where's the best place you've ever been? In the 70s, Nigeria. What's In it like now? Wild, lawless. A lot of corruption. Oh, I thrived on the corruption. Yeah. Yeah. It's mad though. Africa's a beautiful place as well. Yeah. Stunning place. Um, but the world is a beautiful place in a whole. It's just, it's run by corruption. The world runs by, in corruption. It runs by power. It runs by greed. It doesn't care about the average man. It doesn't care if you're poor. It's the rich get richer in this world now and oh, not nothing enough. changes unless the people make a stand. And will that ever happen? I, I genuinely don't know. I hope it does. Not. I just don't want it to happen in one country. I want everybody to unite and go, well, wait a minute. How's the, how does a child from one years old smile three four hundred times a day to then the time they're 18 they smile less than 10 so yeah. whatever system we, we've got in place doesn't work whatever system that we are going through, whatever hoops we are jumping through it doesn't work the schooling system the the educational system the the working system the environment something's not right yeah but then the government they make their money off of people's misery yeah the torment and that's why the system is in place. So people are too caught up in it that they can't f think for themselves and think, well, wait a minute, let's ask the questions. And that's all it's about, it's just asking questions. What's your, what's the best life advice you've you've got over the nearly 80 years on this planet? Be satisfied with what you have. That's it. And love your children, love your wife, that's it. How important is love, Michael? Oh, very. It kept me alive. It helped me to survive. Did you know how to love back then? Not as much as I do now, no. What changed that? Your wife? Yeah. Is she, because I'm very impatient, Did were you impatient in life? Just always try to live on the fast lane instead of slowing it down and appreciating everything around you? No, I don't think I appreciated things as much as I do now, obviously. That's it. Do you owe your wife a lot? <sighs> My life. What would happen if your wife wasn't here when you got to jail in Turkey? Do you think you'd have been active? I think I'd have been active, but I'd have left England. Mm -hmm. That's it. What do you miss most about that life? The power of money. That's it. Yeah? Yeah. It's a mad feeling how paper gives you an inner belief that yeah. you're un not untouchable because there is, you do learn that nobody's untouchable, but it does make you feel invincible sometimes. Is everybody, see everybody you worked with or everybody who was active back then, did everybody go to prison? No. Nope. Some people get out. I mean, they... they the people I imported weed with, most of them are millionaires now. There's four of them in Liverpool who are millionaires. That's it. How many was in your circle? There was six of us. Circle small? Yeah. Anybody turned on each other? No. Nope. No. Nope. That's a good circle then. Mm. Why do you think people turn queens? <sighs> Weakness. Weakness. Yeah, it's weird that, isn't it? Yeah. How people go soft, pretend that they're the big I am, but then when the coppers come knocking, their arse goes. But that's why a lot of people stay at the top of the tree, though, is because they are informants. Yeah. Did you, did you see a lot of drugs in jail? A lot of people on the, on the gear? Yeah. It's spoiled prison, actually, because when I went to Full Sutton, drugs went as prevalent as they were when I left. And 
the whole prison. I mean, you used to get people stealing food because you used to buy your own food. There were freezers where you had your own chickens and beef and lamb and whatever. And it got to the point where you had thieves stealing legs of lamb or chicken to sell and things like that. Yeah. But the system, the, again, the prison system's there to fail. Yeah. They're not there. They're making 40, 50 grand a year per inmate. Yeah. That's a business. That's slavery. Yeah. See, when you were in there, did you feel like a slave? Oh, without a doubt. Because it is, it's cheap labour. Yeah. It's slavery as well. That's where they make their money. That's where they get their cheap labour. Yeah. You're working for three, four pound a week. Yeah. And making them millions. Again, the system. It's the system. I don't have all the answers. I ain't a fucking politician. But... I speak to enough people to understand what's right and what's wrong in the world and where it goes wrong. How are you with authority now? I think I can I, I can take them or leave them. That's it. Do you, you ever feel you still get watched? Well, you wouldn't have surveillance now, but no doubt with your record, man, they might pop in from time to time. I, I spend a little day with you out following you about to see where you're going. I mean, I, the, the uniform... They, they they know me obviously it's the detectives who are the ones who sort of they don't hassle me but they make the presence felt fuck if you were to get another sentence now Michael man that's you'd get a 20 yeah. for, any, for for nothing yeah. do you need to well, be well, I've had a 20 for nothing so <laughs> now I feel <laughs> do you do you feel do you, are you is there any restrictions on your life now none at all so you're just a free man? Yeah. That's a good thing, eh? Yeah. So how do you feel telling your story today? It was nice, relaxing. Brought back a lot of bad memories, but... Yeah. Uh, C'est la vie. Let's talk about some good memories then. What's a good memory in life? Obviously, I know your last son being born, but just any good memories going through your life? Yeah, when I go on holiday with my wife, anywhere we go, we feel good. That's it. How are you going through customs? <laughs> I, the, the machines go off anyway because I've got metal wrists <laughs> and metal knees now so yeah. that's it for anybody that's maybe watching Michael that's maybe want to get involved in a life of crime what advice would you have for them be prepared for the worst that's it and if you can't take do the time and don't do the crime that's it would you like to finish up on anything else Michael no, as I say, it's been nice to talk to you. Nice to meet you. That's it. Yeah, likewise. And once the book's out, we'll make sure to promote it as well for you. And yeah. So people keep your eyes out for the next couple of weeks for the book to be out. Um, we'll leave the Amazon links for people to get it. No doubt about a fascinating read. But Michael, listen, for coming on today and telling your story, I thoroughly enjoyed that. No problem, sir. I you wish take you care. all the best for the future, brother. And uh, stay in touch. Indeed. God bless. You take care.